Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in Ruth and the first part of Samuel. And I am so excited. I love the book of Ruth. It is a tremendously symbolic book. I recognize it can be seen as a little offensive if you focus on the culture of the day and men and women and the role that men play. But I would present to you that the book of Ruth is kept in the scriptures as a symbol. And the symbolism here is we're going to watch a woman that's a Moabite who's outside of Israel come into the very heart and soul. She is going to become the great grandmother of King David, who is the symbol of the very heart and soul of the house of Israel. So someone outside the covenant, way outside the covenant, is going to be brought all the way into the center of the covenant and hold a place of great prestige. And it is through Ruth's loins that we have David and Jesus. Now, I hold that up as a beacon for all of us, because if you were born outside the church, or if sin has brought you outside the covenants, however far out you've landed for whatever reason, the story of Ruth is the story of the journey back to the heart of the Savior, and all that the Savior is going to do to get you there. And he is going to ask some things. So I would invite you to see beyond the story itself, see beyond the culture, see beyond the male-female issues here, and see the symbolism of Jesus is Boaz, and Ruth is all of us that at some point in our lives find ourselves outside and need to come into the heart of the Savior. That's the journey. There are a lot of messages in the Hebrew Bible that emphasize the separateness of the house of Israel. And in this story, we have an outsider, like Bryce says, brought into the center of Israel's history. Ruth is this bridge between Judges and Samuel. Samuel is going to be a book. We're going to start it today, but we're just doing a couple chapters. So we're going to really do an overview of Samuel next time. But Samuel's a book that brings us to the monarchy. We go through a series of kings. We go from Saul to David to Solomon. And David is a descendant of Ruth. Now, don't and you so, think that's kind of a dig here? I mean, it's kind of a gentle dig on the Israelites, Mike, that have a tendency to think they're better than the world around them. And the Lord's going to take one of David's ancestors from an outside group. Yeah. There's a lot of ink spilled on this. Like, what does this mean? But I think for us as Latter-day Saints, I think this is what we can take away from it, that God is the God of the whole world. If there's ever a book that teaches that God is the God of not just the house of Israel, but the whole world, I would say Ruth is one of those, and another one is the book of Jonah. And these two books, Ruth and Jonah, are going to be the springboard for Christianity, because when Jesus comes, he sends his disciples into the whole world to gain proselytes. Now, there's a point in the story where they're in Moab, and they're leaving because the men have died, and... Naomi says, Ruth, you stay here in Moab. You're a young gal. You get remarried to a nice Moabite. And she says, no, I'm going to come with you. And three times, Naomi says, no, don't come. Stay. Three times. And then the fourth time, Ruth says, no, I'm coming. Your God will be my God. It's a beautiful line. We're going to read it. And in rabbinic tradition, they read that and say, we are separate from you. That's their approach. Their approach is we don't want you to join our religion. We don't want to proselyte you. And the message of Christianity is the reverse. The message of Christianity is we want the whole world to know who Jesus is. That's the message of the Book of Mormon. And so to me, Ruth is this glue kind of between these two worldviews. And so I really like it as a message of God's love for his people. And it starts with Naomi. So let's do a little bit of the history. In verse 1, this is why we do it right after Judges. It says, when the judges ruled. So it's in that same time period as the judges. There's a famine. Now, we saw that pride cycle in our last podcast where when they turn against God and they hit that pain phase of the pride cycle, it got very painful. 
And during one of those cycles, there was a famine, and that drove Elimelech out of Israel, out of where his family was dwelling, and up into Moab because there's food there. He takes his wife and their two sons, and while they're there, the two sons marry, it says in verse 4, women of Moab. So not Israelite women that went with them. The two sons marry women of Moab, Orpah and Ruth. And then they dwell there for 10 years. By the way, as a side note, that's where Oprah Winfrey gets her name. Her mom tried to name her Orpah, but it was misspelled. That's coming from that verse. Anyway, that's just a little cultural reference. Anyway, go on, Bryce. So eventually all three of the men die. Naomi's husband dies, and then her two sons die. So Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law, who were daughters of the country, daughters of Moab. So if she finally hears that there's bread in Israel, so she says, I'm going home. And she says to her daughters-in-law, verse 8, go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you. She kissed them and wept. And they say in verse 10, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Now that was Orpah and Ruth. Naomi turns around and says, turn again, my daughters. Will you go with me? Are there any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Go back home, my daughters. Go your way. I am too old to have a husband and to bear you my sons. And by the way, verse 13, would you even wait till they were old enough? Why are you staying with me? And that's what the Abrahamic covenant is all about. Beyond Abraham, this is the moment. This is where every one of us who are current descendants of Abraham and are under covenant to live that Abrahamic covenant, this is the lesson I would point you to. She says to her two daughters, it is better for you to stay here in Moab. I'm going home. You stay here. But she has made it so loving. She's created such a loving relationship that they don't want to leave her. And then at this point, Orpah says she's going back. So Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and weeps. She weeps at this and stays. But verse 14, Ruth clave unto her. So one more time, Naomi says, your sister's gone back. And I, it, it's interesting in verse 15 that she says she's gone back to her gods. Again, suggesting that the Moabites are not that covenant Israel people. And that Orpah has returned to her people and to her gods. And that you should do the same, Ruth. And then verse 16. Absolute beautiful verse. And this is the kind of people we should be. This is living the Abrahamic covenant. When we create relationships where people said, I want your God to be my God. Ruth says to Naomi, verse 16, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. Where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And then verse 18 has this beautiful phrase, she steadfastly minded to go with her. If we were that kind of people to the Moabites in our lives, where people said, I want your God to be my God, then we have fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. So that's the setting. And now they head back to Bethlehem. That's where they're going to end. They're going to come back to the heart of Israel. And when they get there, they're going to say, hey, is this Naomi? And she says, no, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly unto me. And then this phrase, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Yeah, that, that word has to do with being bitter or it relates with water or food. Um, she is very bitter because she left to go to Moab and lost everything. She lost her sons. She lost her husband. And over and over again in the Old Testament, we read that God is the God of widows and orphans. And so essentially, that's the position that Ruth and Naomi sit in. They sit in this position of a vulnerable woman 
coming to Bethlehem, the house of bread, which parenthetically will be the place where Jesus will be born. And so there's layers of imagery here and it's a famine. So there's this irony here, right? The house of bread, Bethlehem is the place where there's no food. And yet there are people that have food. And so they come to this place to this man, his name is Boaz of the family of Elimelech, and he's a wealthy individual and he has fields. Now, it's so ironic that she, you know, she looks at her life and sees, I have nothing. I left with everything and I'm coming back empty with nothing. And yet the truth is she's bringing David's great grandmother to Israel. So sometimes we look at our lives and we see emptiness, but The Lord is being extremely good here, and sometimes we just need to have the faith to see it. So she comes back to Bethlehem. She's near her kinfolk. Here's Boaz. And now? Now in this chapter, she starts to reap the fields. And this is rooted in Old Testament law. There are these verses in Deuteronomy and in the Torah that talk about this idea where the Lord wants the poor to be taken care of. And so... If you were to draw a square, and that square represents a field, the circle in the square would be where the owner of the field could take the grain and send in the reapers, and they would reap the grain. And the edges of the field, that's where the poor can go and glean the field. And there's all these rules in the Torah. We linked them in the show notes if you want to read them. There are all these laws in the Torah that talk about how to take care of the poor and allowing the poor to glean the fields after they've been reaped. That's how the Lord takes care of the poor. And so Ruth is going to be one that does this. And she goes and she works all day. And I want to read a couple verses. Let's go to chapter two. In chapter two, verse seven, we read, she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And so she came and has continued even from the morning until now, and she tarried a little in the house. That verse, essentially what it's saying is she worked all day and she barely even rested. She worked all day to glean the fields, pick up the grain that's left over. And then said Boaz to Ruth, hearest thou not, my daughter, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide fast here by my maidens. And so essentially she meets Boaz, this near kinsman, the word is Gaal or Goel, and that word means a redeemer or a fixer or one who avenges in case something goes wrong in your life. He fixes things so that you can be redeemed. And that's the root of where we get the idea of redeemer, like the redeemer meaning Jesus. He redeems us or buys us back and fixes the wrongs. And so the word for kinsman throughout this text is Gael or Goel, depending on how it's conjugated. But that's the idea. He's a redeemer. He's a kinsman. That's the word that's English. The English word is kinsman, but it's this redeemer. And so he says, I'm going to take care of you. You can go ahead and glean these fields. Now, what's interesting is look how much she gets. In chapter two, she works And if you go to verse 17, it says, so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. Now we put this in the show notes because we don't know exactly. There's a lot of different measurements for how much this could have been at this time period, but it's a lot. She carried home an impressive amount for a gleaner. One estimate is is that her load would have weighed close to 50 pounds of grain. Now, I can't even imagine gleaning the field. You're and getting picking that. up very small handfuls at a time. Right. I think that whatever it was she got, I mean, that's a lot, right? I think the author is trying to tell us that she has been abundantly blessed. And that's a, an image I think that's going to fit in line with seeing Boaz as an image of Jesus because he's so bounteous in his blessing. And then look at verse 12. In verse 12, we read where Boaz says to her, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's an image for coming to Jesus under his wings is this idea of being embraced by the Savior. So this journey of a Moabite woman named Ruth ends in the embrace of a man who symbolizes Christ. 
So let's begin to make two lists here. Let's make a list of what Boaz is doing as a reminder to all of us, whether you're outside the covenant because of something you've done, whether you're outside the covenant because you don't feel like you fit into the church, whether you're outside because you were born out and you just don't understand this culture, whatever reason, we're going to make a list of what Boaz does so that you know what Jesus is doing this whole time. And then we're going to make a list of what he asks Ruth to do and what Ruth does as a message of things we need to do as we come to Christ. So I love back in verse 5 of chapter 2, when Boaz first sees her, he says, whose damsel is this? And that's my Jesus number one. He sees you. He's known Ruth all her life, way up in Moab. He sees that she's here. He knows you. I would remind you that the very first word out of the Father's mouth in the sacred grove was not, who are you? The first word was Joseph. He knows us. He recognizes us. That's Jesus number one. But here's Ruth number one. The first thing Jesus asks us to do in verse eight is, go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here. That's step number one for us. We need to be committed and to stay in Jesus's fields. We need to cut the ties that pull us away from him and say, I'm going to glean here. This is the field. He notices me and I choose to stay in his fields. And then notice how much he starts to take care of Ruth. Starting in verse 9, he says to Ruth, Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? When thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And here's my Jesus number two. As we come unto Christ, we gain greater and greater safety. He makes it more and more safe the closer we come to him. He protects us. He can only protect us if we fall under that covering of his. That covering will, in fact, protect us from harm, and it will quench our thirst. So she's coming to Jesus. He's starting to protect and quench her thirst. In verse 10, he gives us another Ruth. Here's what I would say is my Ruth number two. She says, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou should take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? I think this illustrates the humility that is often required as we come unto Christ. It's that loving gratitude that prevents us from being prideful. That's an essential element of coming unto Christ, is humility. My Ruth number three is in verse 11. Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. In other words, part of the journey to Christ is to start acting like him. I am supposed to act more and more like him as I come to him. And Boaz says, the way you've treated your mother-in-law, the way you've walked away from other gods and left them behind you, that is a sign. She's coming unto Christ. And then that leads us to verse 12, where I would say, this is my Jesus number three and my Ruth number four. Boaz says, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord of Israel, under whose wing thou art come to trust. Coming unto Christ means that we start to trust him. We have faith in him. We trust him when trials come into our life. We trust that he's taking me where I need to go, even if I can't see where I need to go. So there's my part. That's Ruth number four. You have to come to trust him. But as you do, my Jesus number three list adds, he puts you under his wing. Do you see all those things? He says, I will make sure the men don't touch you. 
I will quench your thirst. I will put you under my wing. And then I would add a Ruth number five is in verse 14. Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. You have to start eating the bread of Christ. Coming unto Christ means we pray, we read the scriptures. We do the things that we consider eating the bread of Christ. No matter how far out of Israel you've been, no matter how far out of the covenant you found yourself, open up those scriptures, start to read, kneel down, pray, eat the bread of Christ. Now, if we eat the bread of Christ, here's my Jesus number four. Notice all that Christ is beginning to do and has been willing to do all along, but now that we're coming unto him, he has a greater ability to do it. In verse 15, he tells the men, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. That's the circle Mike was talking about. She is no longer limited to gleaning in the corners where the law of Moses requires we leave them for the poor, this woman can glean even inside the circle. And don't reproach her. And let fall some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them. Meaning, as you're harvesting the very best of the barley, let a few really good stalks fall on the ground and let her have them. Do you see that hand-holding that's happening? You've got Ruth, who's coming to trust Christ, who's starting to eat his bread, who's no longer going to glean in anyone else's fields, and you've got a Savior who's telling the young man, you don't touch her. You make sure she has water to drink, let her glean where typically the poor don't glean, and let fall some of the good barley that she can have. He is covering her with goodness and mercy and kindness, and she is starting to make covenants with him and change the way she's living. Do you see how that happens? Now, I've got one more on my Ruth list in chapter 2. He says in verse 21 and then in verse 23, keep fast by First, he says, by my young men. And then in verse 23, he says, keep fast by the maidens. In other words, as we come unto Christ, we need to surround ourselves with people who are also coming unto Christ. You don't have to do this alone. Coming unto Christ is an individual journey, but it's not a journey we make alone. Surround yourself with people who are making that same journey seek them out. One of the reasons we go to church, one of the reasons we have church gatherings is so that we can keep fast by other people who are on that same journey trying to find Christ and come unto him. So just to reiterate, she gleans more than I think would have been expected. It's a lot. And you notice at the end of chapter two that she goes from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. So this is indicative of seasons, time, Boaz watches her, he's her redeemer, and he sees her over a period of time. And so from chapter two, we go into chapter three where things are going to shift. So chapter- You're going to get really serious here. Right. Ruth has been gleaning for some seasons, and now Naomi's going to come and make a suggestion. And she's going to say to her daughter-in-law, I want you to propose a union with Boaz. And notice what she says. She says that she should seek rest in verse one. And then in verse two, she tells her that he is at the threshing floor. And then she says in verse three, that she is to wash thyself and to anoint herself and put raiment upon herself and get thee down to the floor. That's the threshing floor, the Goran. That's an important symbol. And then it says, make not thyself known to the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, when thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay down, he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And so that's her instruction. And so she does. She went down, verse 6, to the Goran, to the threshing floor. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he's lying down at this corn, it says in the text, or grain, and she uncovered his feet 
Then in verse 9, he says, Who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, thy handmaiden. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman, or her goel, her, her redeemer. Now that word for skirt can be his wings or his feathers. That's what the word is used for, a border. And so it's this idea of cover me, like put your arms around me and cover me. And this is just drenched in temple imagery. Wash, anoint, clothe, cover. Yes. So why is threshing floor so significant, Mike? That is a, that's emphasized numerous times in this story. It is. It's a really important image. And I'm going to be brief here, but once again, I say this all the time, there is a deep dive in the show notes, so go there and check it out. But the threshing floor was a place in antiquity where you could settle legal disputes. And if you think about this, the whole book of Ruth is going to be a legal dispute over who is able to marry her. And so they're going to settle that at the gate. Well, the gate was also where the threshing floor could have been. And it may be in this context. The threshing floor was also in antiquity, especially in the ancient Near East, the symbol for the temple. And it was actually the foundation stone of the Israelite temple. We'll read this at the end of Samuel. At the end of Samuel, we read that David purchases from a Jebusite and his name is Arvna. And and that's that's a pun on the word for ark. Uh, He's going to purchase the threshing floor that will be this flat stone in Jerusalem, which will be the foundation stone underneath which the Holy of Holies will be. And so the threshing floor in antiquity represented sacred space, the connection between heaven and earth. And so in, in the ancient world, it had an aura of sanctity. Now, one of the reasons why is because people would come and bring their grain, and the community eating grain, it represented to them the bond of heaven and earth, and also there were a lot of cultures that had this view that the God would come down and die, like the seed would come down, come out of the ground and be grown, and then it would die. They would grind it up and make bread out of it, and when you ate the bread, you were eating the God. And there were a lot of different cultures that did this. And I see this and go, yeah, that's because we're talking about Jesus. I see all this stuff rooted in the Savior and all these different cultures are spinoffs of this idea that was once the grand idea, the grand plan. So it's the temple. The threshing floor was also a site of fertility. And so that image of covering the feet represents fertility to the ancient world. It was also the origin of the temple drama. And many scholars even say it's actually the origin of even theater itself. Even the idea of the sacred drama of the ages came out of the temple. Today, we've secularized the drama. And so when we go to movies and those kinds of things, it's for entertainment and it's secular. But in the ancient world, it was rooted in holiness coming to understand who God is. And in this threshing floor, at this place where the community would come and gather their grain, the king would be involved in a sacred marriage and he would be ritually married at the threshing floor. There would also be in this drama, sacred combat associated with the new year rites. And all of these things are happening at this space. So with that in mind, we have this image of a woman and a man coming together in union. She's proposing marriage. She's asking him to cover her and we're at the threshing floor. And this man, Boaz, represents Jesus. So I think big picture, I'm kind of with Bryce on this, where I see we're Ruth. We are asking Jesus to cover us. And so if we think about this, where are we oriented in the temple? It's this image of coming into the Holy of Holies, embracing the Savior. And the image of the seeds is so powerful because even in the Book of Mormon, Jesus references this. Now, he doesn't say threshing floor, but he says Floor. Look at this. Go to 3 Nephi 20, verse 18. Jesus says, I will gather my people together as a man gathereth his sheaves into the floor. That's the image I want to leave is this threshing floor where Boaz and Ruth covenant to love one another at the threshing floor. If we read this and overlay it with 2 Samuel 24, where the threshing floor will become the foundation for the temple, this is temple imagery. And I think that's important. As you come unto Christ, we need to make covenants with him. Coming unto Christ is promising him certain things and him covering you. And that covenant relationship where we hold each other by the hand and we hold tightly onto each other. So clearly there's a reference here to the temple. And I think it's all encoded, but I see it here. 
And I think it starts right there in verse one with seeking rest. And then you get into washing and anointing the threshing floor and eating and drinking. We're, we're doing these images all over again. They're all encoded in there. So I see this as beautiful. Now, he doesn't say, I'm going to marry you. He says, listen, there's a, there's a nearer kinsman. He's anonymous in, in chapter four, but he says, there's a nearer kinsman. We've got to give him first pick. Meaning someone else has claim on you. And I like to think of this symbolically as the law of justice. The law has claim on you because of our transgressions, because of what we've done, because of living in Moab, we owe a debt to the law. And Jesus is saying, I have to reconcile this debt you have. Someone else has claim on you. Let me go advocate for you. Let me go pay the price so that you are mine. Now, don't get caught up in the culture of him saying, I've bought Ruth. See this as Jesus saying, I have paid your debt. That other person who has claim on you no longer has claim on you. And now I have you. And so that's kind of the symbolism of what's about to happen. Yeah. He gives her six measures of barley before the meeting in chapter four. And if those six measures are six ephahs, she can't carry them. And so I think that's another image of his blessing is more than we can possibly carry. Some of the early rabbis kind of looked at this and said, well, maybe what he gave her wasn't six measures. Maybe he gave her six grains of barley as a portent that their future son would be blessed with six blessings, they said, the spirit of wisdom and discernment, counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's all quoting Isaiah 11, verse 2. And so other rabbis suggested that the six grains could represent her six righteous descendants, David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now that's pure speculation. We don't know. But if he does give her six ephahs, it's either 285 pounds or 174 pounds of barley, more than she's going to carry. And so I think that's a beautiful image, once again, of God gives you us more than we ask. We come to him in faith, and when the day is done, we look back and say, the Lord is so bounteous in his blessings. I think that really ties into one of the teachings from Elder Anderson, where he said that there are compensatory spiritual gifts from heaven for the righteous. Because we live in this world that's challenging, God will compensate us for these difficult circumstances. And then he says, as we recognize and embrace them, they heighten our spiritual sensitivities, offering us greater assurance and confidence. And that's really what I see Ruth doing here in this at the end of chapter three. And so in chapter four, we get to this place where they're at the gate and Boaz has all the people there and the gate is where they would settle legal disputes. And we think this is probably by the Goran, by the threshing floor. And we have this anonymous kinsman in verse one. We're not told who he is. And Boaz says, do you want to take her? If you do, you take the land, uh, the land of Elimelech. And basically he says, okay, I'll do it. He says, I'll do it in verse four. But then in verse five, Boaz says, What day thou buyest the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And then the anonymous kinsman said in verse 6, I'm not going to do it. The man doesn't accept her hand. And so Boaz says, I'll do it. Verse 9, Boaz says to the elders and unto this people, Your witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilean's and Malan's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malan, have I purchased to be my wife. This verse where Boaz redeems her is an example of chesed. And that word is this covenant love. That word is woven throughout as a golden thread through the text. And it starts at the beginning of chapter one, verse eight, where Naomi says, go and return each to her mother's house. The Lord will deal kindly with you. The Lord will show you chesed. You see in Ruth, all of the main characters demonstrate chesed in a variety of ways. Ruth shows it through her unwavering covenant loyalty and love to Naomi, by remaining with her mother-in-law when she returned to Bethlehem, and by seeking to marry Boaz in order to carry on the line of Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband. Boaz, he shows chesed by caring more about 
Elimelech's name and his line than his own. You see, when he marries Ruth, Elimelech's name and line continues. And so he is giving Elimelech an heir. Naomi also demonstrates mercy or hesed to Ruth by taking her to her homeland and bringing her home into her faith. Naomi also testified in verse 8 of chapter 1 of the hesed of the Lord. And she does it again in chapter 2, verse 20. Look in 2.20. This is what she says. Naomi says to her daughter, Blessed be of the Lord, who has not left off his hesed to the living and the dead. And so the Lord has it, Naomi has it, Ruth has this covenant love, Boaz has it as well. And this is emphasized throughout the entire text. This whole text is this beautiful matrix of images of different people showing covenant love. And that is the root of who Jesus is. He's this God that will move heaven and earth to reclaim us. But if we look at this whole story, And it's brief, but it's beautiful. Everyone is doing their part. It's a dance. Jesus is doing it. Boaz is doing it. Ruth and Naomi, everyone is playing their part. And I see this as the grand story of the human family. And it's all to me cosmically brought to the threshing floor where we covenant to come back to the Lord, where he says in 3 Nephi, I will bring back my grain, my seed, and I'm bringing it back to this holy space, this floor, this Goran, this threshing floor, that is the cosmic center where heaven and earth meet. And that to me is also the image of the gleaning. You see, if the field's a square and you're drawing a circle inside of it and you're pulling out the grain and those edges are where she gleans, but then later, like Bryce says, she's brought into the circle, that image of a circle and square could be an image of heaven and earth coming together. And that's a beautiful symbol for the temple but it's also a beautiful symbol for marriage. The love of a man and a woman brought together the circle and the square put together in covenant. It's very beautiful. And I really think that these images are in the text and they're just asking us to engage with them. So this journey of a Moabite woman named Ruth ends in the embrace of a man who symbolizes Christ. And your journey, wherever you are, however far out you've come, our journey ends married to Christ, embraced by him, purchased by him, freed by him, covered and protected by him. And the rest of chapter four is the rest of the story that Boaz and Ruth have a baby named Obed. Obed has a child named Jesse. And Jesse has a child named David. So Ruth has been brought right into the very center of the covenant. And it is through Ruth's loins that we have David and Jesus. She is the mother of David and the mother of Jesus. That physical coming to earth Jesus is going to come through the loins of Ruth and David. An outsider. An outsider. And if that's not symbolic of the Abrahamic covenant and everything that we stand for in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I don't know that you're going to find a better image. Ruth as an image of an outsider who comes into the very center and becomes the mother and the ancestor of David and Jesus. It's a beautiful story. So I think we should all have hope no matter how far out of the covenants we once have been or are. That if we will do those things, stop gleaning in anyone else's fields, eat the Savior's bread, make covenants with him, trust him as he begins to put us under his wing. If we'll do those things, we will end up in the bosom of the Savior. Now, the next piece of the puzzle is Samuel. We've got to get Samuel here. And Samuel's coming is Hannah's story and Eli's story. And we're going to focus on Samuel in our next podcast. But let's talk a little bit about Hannah and the boy Samuel. So we start off in the mountains of Ephraim. That's verse 1. And we're introduced to this guy, and his name is Elkanah. Now, the English is just going to read Elkanah. So you can just say Elkanah, but it's pronounced at least the way the Masoretes put it out there. Elkanah. And he's there in Mount Ephraim. 
And remember, we're building this bridge from judges to the monarchy. And the entire book of Judges, we really don't know where the tabernacle is, but we have this clue. If you go to Judges 20, verse 18, it says the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God, or they went up to Bethel. And then it talks about in verse 27 that the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days at Bethel. So we think it's at Bethel in Judges 20. But when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, the tabernacle of God is not in Bethel but it's in Shiloh. And so it's here where Hannah's going yearly, verse three, to worship. You see, we don't have a temple until David purchases that threshing floor that we talked about at Jerusalem. It's going to be called Jerusalem. And then David's son, Solomon, is going to build the temple. So in this space between David and the judges, we have this tabernacle that's moving around, It's this portable shrine. Remember, the Israelites had it with them in the wilderness. And so it's here at Shiloh. And this is where Hannah comes. And she comes there because verse 5, it says that the Lord had shut up her womb. In the Hebrew text, a lot of times it indicates that the Lord has the power to open and close the womb. That's kind of how it's portrayed. And so Hannah comes to petition the Lord to open her womb, that she may have children. Every one of us will go through periods of deprival, periods where the righteous blessing we seek is not forthcoming. And whatever that bitterness is, whatever righteous blessing you're seeking, and the Lord is holding back for a time, you are in Hannah's situation. I think you're also in Emma Smith's situation in section 25, verse 4, where the Lord tells Emma, Murmur not because of the things that have been withheld, because they have been withheld, and that's wisdom in me. And we're in Hannah's situation, we're in Emma's situation, and we're in bitterness of soul because something I righteously desire, and I can't see a reason why I shouldn't have it, is being held back. So here's the good news. Hannah is at the temple, and she vows a vow. And she says in verse 11, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. I will give him to be a servant in the temple. Yeah. And so after she vows the vow, uh, the priest there at Shiloh, at the tabernacle, his name's Eli, and he sees her and he sees her praying. And he essentially says in verse 17, go in peace. The God of Israel has heard your petition. He's going to grant it to you. And so she leaves with this hope because the high priest there at Shiloh says, God's going to bless you. And so then we get to verse 19. And that long awaited blessing comes. I love what she says later in verse 27, where she says, for this child, I prayed and the Lord hath given my petition. So Hannah is finally blessed with a child. She raises him to the point where he's weaned, and then she presents him at the temple. And that little boy is now going to be the main character for the next several chapters by the name of Samuel. So there is wisdom in God occasionally for withholding that blessing for a time. The Lord allows us to go through that bitterness of soul until the blessing comes. Hang on until the blessing comes, because the blessing is going to come. But here's what I want you to know about the God that you worship. Not only in his timing will the blessing come, but go to chapter 2. After she presents Samuel to the temple, as she brings Samuel and presents him to Eli and says, this is the child I prayed for, you may now have him as a servant in the temple, and I'm going to come up and visit him whenever I come to the temple— But look at verse 21. The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. I believe with all my soul in a God of three scoops of ice cream is how I refer to him. And I've told this story. Let me just give you a summary. When my first daughter was two years old and new parents as we were, we didn't have her immunized on time and she's now two years old and she's behind and I've got to take her in to the doctor. And that day she got three shots. And you can imagine the look a two-year-old would give her father when she's getting these shots. How could you do this to me? 
That's the bitterness of soul that Hannah is going to know. And there is going to come a moment in our life where the Lord for our good is going to do something that's painful. And we may look up at him with those same eyes and say, how could you do this to me? We may have that Joseph Smith moment where we pound our fist and say, oh God, where art thou? We may have those moments of bitterness of soul. But do you know what I did to my daughter after she got three shots? I took her out for three scoops of ice cream and big scoops too. I promise you that she did not remember the shots. She remembered the ice cream. It is my witness to all of you that when God puts us through the bitterness of soul period for reasons he understands and we don't, someday will come not only the blessing we sought, but more than that, greater blessings than the one we sought. Hannah ended up with four sons and two daughters, and she prayed for one. That's the Hannah story I would like to tell is the bitterness of soul led to a blessing and then an abundant blessing. That's who God is. And when you're in that bitterness of soul period, hang on and trust that not only is the blessing coming in the Lord's time, but a greater blessing than the one you're asking for is also coming. That's the kind of God that we worship. Yeah. There's a beautiful psalm here in the second chapter And this is the song of Hannah. She gives this beautiful prayer in verse one. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. And my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. I see a lot of this in the song of Hannah as a triumphant song of an individual who has overcome their adversaries, but it's also got a lot of things in it that are related to the temple and the combat drama and the king being enthroned. And some people look at this song and say, why is she giving this prayer? There's no monarchy. What's going on with the reference to the king and those kinds of things? And maybe, maybe she's sitting in the position of she's a prophet and she sees the future. Maybe this is put in later by editors. I don't care. It's beautiful, but there's so many neat ways to read it. But look at verse five. She has four sons and two daughters, right? You have Samuel and then the unnamed children in verse 21. But notice verse five. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Interesting. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. Who is this God that we worship? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. Remember, rising from the dust is this image of resurrection. We're coming out of chaos. We're coming forth. We're standing before the king, if we're thinking about this liturgically in a temple setting. And he lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. That's another way of saying lifting up the poor from the dust. To set them among the princes, kings and queens. Think about that imagery. And to make them that inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will, verse 9, keep the feet of his saints. Now, there's a lot of ways to read that. But one of the ways we can read this is God will bless his saints with fertility. And notice that the wicked will be silent in darkness. We're going to get that when we get to Isaiah, where he tells Babylon to sit in darkness. And then go to verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So there's this reference to a great and mighty king, and it's right here in the midst of the mouth of this woman who is at Shiloh during the time when there is no monarchy. And we have this loose confederation of tribes. And so we read this and say, what is this? And I see this as, to me, as a, as a person who loves Jesus and I love the Bible, I see verse 10 as a beautiful prophecy about the Savior. In fact, I see the entire song of Hannah 
in a liturgical temple setting, that God's going to bless his saints. He's going to give them fertility. We're going to come to the rock. He's going to give them strength. The king and queen will be anointed. In this case, it's going to be the savior, but all who follow him will be anointed as kings and queens. And so there's a lot of really cool ways to read the Song of Hannah, and it's just kind of tucked away in here. And then we go and we shift gears and we talk about how how rough Eli's sons were. They're scoundrels, it says, or verse 12 calls them sons of Belial. And what that's setting up is the tension for Samuel, because you see Samuel is Hannah's son, and Eli is going to raise Samuel, but Eli is the high priest, and his sons, who should inherit that position, are not worthy. And so Samuel is going to take their place. And so that's kind of what's going on with verse 12. And then there's a bunch of stuff in here in these chapters that cover their rough behavior. Their names are Hophni and Phinehas, if you go to chapter 2, verse 34. And there's this prophecy that they're to die. Now, they don't die until we get to next week in 2 Samuel 4, but Hophni and Phinehas' bad behavior is going to be the catalyst that is going to put Samuel in the position that they should inherit. So now we get to chapter 3, where we begin Samuel sliding into that position, the kind of person he's going to be with this beautiful little story that symbolizes us in so many ways— where God is speaking to us, and we don't recognize that it's coming from the Lord. And when we finally say to him, I'm listening, that's when he speaks clearly. So let's jump to chapter 3. Notice verse 1, the sad story of what's going on is that there was no open vision. This is a dark period in the house of Israel, and there is no open vision. And it kind of makes sense because Judges was such a mess. I mean, we're coming out of that dark time, aren't we? And Eli, who seems to have been a bright light at some point, his eyes are waxing dim, and he is getting to the point where he can't see. And clearly, his sons are not going to inherit that prophetic role. So verse 4, the Lord called Samuel. He called out. He spoke to him. And just like the voice in Third Nephi that calls out and is not recognized, how many times has God called all of us and, and spoken out and we haven't recognized it? Samuel says, here am I. And he ran to Eli. Verse 5, notice that? He ran to Eli. So many times in my experience, I have realized later on in my life that the source was God, but I assumed it was something else. Sometimes impressions have come that I have brushed off as coincidence or my own remembering, which I now recognize was the hand of the Lord in my life. So he runs to Eli, here am I, for you called me. Eli said, I didn't call you, go back to sleep. Verse 6, The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So we ran to Eli. Here am I. Eli says, I didn't call you. Now notice verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Learning to speak the language of inspiration is very much like learning a language. At first, we understand nothing. And then the more we pay attention, we start to recognize certain words and certain phrases. And then we begin to learn the language. We learn the language of revelation. So the Lord called Samuel a third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, here am I. Now Eli knows what's going on. End of verse 8, Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So now hopefully we all have an Eli in our life that says, In verse 9, go lie down, and if it shall be that he call thee, sit up and say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down, and now the Lord came, stood as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. And this is the moment, right? This is the defining moment that's going to cause Samuel to be the Samuel that we need him to be. And hopefully this is our moment. Hopefully every single one of us continually have this moment where Samuel answers and says, Speak, for thy servant heareth. I want my life to say to him, Lord, speak, because I'm listening. And sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we run to Eli. But we need to come back to that moment and say, 
speak, Lord, because now I'm listening. I love in the third Nephi account in chapter 11, where they hear the voice and they don't recognize it. And they hear the voice and they don't recognize it. They had to open their ears. Now, I don't know how to close my ears physically. So I love that phrase. You have to open your ears. Revelation is happening in your life. God is speaking. But the more we open our ears and say to him, speak, for thy servant heareth, then the Lord begins to speak and we begin to communicate with him. So that's kind of where we end this week, the preparation of the boy, Samuel, to become the prophet, Samuel, that's now going to lead Israel into this period of monarchy and king and God being with their kings and prophets counseling their kings, which is the next stage of the Old Testament period where we have a monarchy and a united kingdom. But before we can have a monarchy and a united kingdom, we have to have a significant oracle and a prophet. Yeah. Many kingdoms in the time period that Israel is doing their kings, the kings many times could kind of do what they wanted to do. But in the Bible, the kings listen to these prophets. Now, when they do, things work out, right? There's going to be examples when the kings don't. But when they listen, we'll see this with Hezekiah and Isaiah, and we'll see this in other places. But when they listen, things work out. And I think at the end of this, come follow me, we're ending in 1 Samuel 3, Go to the end, go to verse 19. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. That's a merism. Dan to Beersheba is like, if you're an American, from sea to shining sea, from the top Dan all the way to the bottom Beersheba, they knew that Samuel was a prophet. And then you get to verse 21 and it can be translated a lot of different ways. I'm going to translate it a little bit different because... That's what I do. I'm a weirdo. But look at this. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself or appeared to Samuel in Shiloh. And I'm just going to change this for by the word of the Lord. I'm going to say it's, you can take that preposition and say in, in the word of the Lord. I think that's a better translation. It's in the debar of the Lord. To me, that can be read as in his word, but it can also be in that space, that holy of holies, in that oracle, in the debir. In other words, God is communicating to Samuel in his word, but he's also appearing to him. That's how I'm reading verse 21, that Samuel is sitting in the space of other Old Testament prophets, like the brother of Jared, like Isaiah, like Adam, they're seeing the Lord and they're seeing him in this sacred space. And so finally, we're coming out of the darkness. If you remember in Judges, it's kind of a mess. And then Ruth is this glue between Judges and the monarchy. And we're coming out of this. And now we have a prophet. He's called as a young man. And Thomas S. Monson said this, where he says, isn't it interesting that the Lord called a young man? like Samuel. And then he kind of likens that to the prophet Joseph Smith. And we're going to see Samuel do some really good things to try to direct Israel and the kings to make good decisions. And other prophets will do this too. They'll be advisors to the king to help them to channel this energy that is Israel in a way that fits with what the Lord has designed for these people. And the degree to which they listen to the counsel of the prophet, miraculous things. Hezekiah will listen to Isaiah, and he will take on the entire Syrian army and take a stand against them. He was a bug that should have been squashed by a massive elephant, but he listens to the prophet. And as the kings listen to the prophets, they stand against their opposition, they are blessed, they are protected. But as the kings push against those prophets and even fight to destroy them, as Ahab will do, that brings the downfall of the kingdom. And so now we're entering into a whole new stage of the Old Testament where we see a monarchy, but it begins with the establishment of a prophet that everyone acknowledged has the Lord with him. And the degree to which they listen to that prophet will bring their success. 
And with that, we will see you next week when we continue with the story of Samuel and the Kings. Thanks for listening and make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.